Uh, now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Sashi Pereira uh, to speak on when science meets kindness and mindfulness. Uh, Dr. Sashi Pereira is an investigator in the Brain Health Research Program at PHRI, Assistant Professor Medicine Neurology, McMaster University, and a stroke neurologist at Hamilton Health Sciences. Her main research focus is on secondary stroke prevention, uh, cryptogenic stroke, and uncommon causes of a stroke, and the optimization of clinical care in this patient population. Dr. Sashi Pereira. Great. Thank you, Bante, uh, for the kind introduction and for um, inviting me to speak on this session. And when you initially asked me to speak on this session, um, I was like thinking, okay, what should I talk about? And then, um, but then I thought a little bit and then uh, this great idea of uh, talking about when science meets kindness, what happens to our brain and how it improves our physical health came to my mind. It is, um, Thank you for all the speakers for sharing that amazing uh, their stories and I think like we will see once uh, during this talk like how why like why is the body responding to us on this way and I was born and raised in Sri Lanka and I moved to Canada in my mid-20s and I've um, si since moving to Canada actually I was not that big on even though I was bo born a Buddhist I was not that big on meditation or like what does this do to your mind but then um, anything for me to make sense I had to uh, have a scientific explanation so I started looking up at how does this help so this is what I will talk to you about today and feel free to interrupt me any moments to ask any questions if you have anything so as we all know uh, brain is the most complex structure in the body and we know more about all other organs in the body. We don't have any questions or any um, secrets of, of any other organ, but in brain, we, we only know like half of what it's doing. There's millions and millions of neurons and about hundred trillion neuronal connections. And they talk to each other via neurotransmitters, chemicals or hormones. So there are different kinds of hormones and chemical transmitters. Um, and these are, there are, happy chemicals that makes you feel good, uh, that makes you motivated. And there are also uh, these mm, not so happy chemicals, I'll call them. I won't call them bad chemicals because you do need them uh, to some extent. So um, what are these happy chemicals of the brain? So there are four main happy chemicals of the brain and uh, dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins. We'll go over what each of them do to our bodies and then how we can increase these happy, um, happy hormones and keep them at the constant level. So the dopamine is known as the um, chemical that motivates yourself. So it, it motivates you, it gives you pleasure and it uh, allows you to accomplish goals and desires. Again, dopamine, too much dopamine, like sometimes we seek that dopamine surge and too much dopamine seeking that we can do it chemically. This is too much of that can lead to addictions and um, all, all the gab gambling and all those problems. So we have to ha achieve this balance of where is the good dopamine amount is needed to the body. So, um, and oxytocin is also called the cuddle or love hormones. This is the hormone that helps like bonding with mom, uh, mother and child bonding. And this motivates you to build and sustain relationships. So this is uh, called the kind of allows you to trust other people. Like we are inherently, we have this um, thought that, okay, when someone does something to us, is there ulterior, mom, uh, ulterior thinking behind that? So this oxytocin actually, uh, allows us to not question the ulterior motives and accept that act of kindness. And then serotonin is the kind of the mood stabilizer. This is very, very important. And it also allows us to feel significant and important among peers and also to accept ourselves as we are and to, um, and to be yourself with the people around you. And then endorphins, uh, is a whole, uh, chemical that helps you mask physical pain. It doesn't mean you don't feel the pain, like the pain is there obviously if there's a stimuli, 
but then you would not feel that pain as much if there's enough endorphins in the in your body so people with let less endorphins would feel more pain compared to people with more endorphins in their body. Um, so these happy chemicals in your brain actually allows you to reach your goals. And however, once you reach your goal, these happy hormones are gone until you do another goal. So even if you do an act of kindness, these, yeah, you get these um, happy hormones and then until you do a next act, it's gone. So how do we find this balance would be the question. Before we go to that, I would like to um, show, just talk a little bit, a bit of like, what does like uh, low levels of these hormones cause to your body? So dopamine, because it's the motivation um, chemical, it would definitely cause lack of motivation if you have lack of that. And then which would, the, lead to spiral activities of reduced energy, inability to focus, and then feeling anxious. And also lack of oxytocin will lead you to um, like disconnect with relationship and not uh, trusting people, feeling anxious and insomnia. And serotonin, obviously, because it's the mood stabilizer. If you lack that, you would have mood swings. And sometimes we wonder, okay, why, like you, you yourself get surprised. Like why are my moods, um, uh, changing so much. So that, that is an indicator that your body is lacking serotonin. And they would, because of this, they would uh, develop feeling of hopelessness, social phobia, obsessions and compulsions. So, and also as mentioned, endorphin, if you lack that, you would have feel more aches and pains. So how does, um, uh, so these are the happy chemicals of the brain and the deficiencies cause this. Before we talk about how to increase these happy chemicals, let's talk about these not so happy chemicals of the body, um, of the brain. So from, uh, with our evolution from when we, uh, even in mammals, we have this hormone cortisol, which keeps us aware of the environment. And it is a survival hormone and it is released when there's a threat to survival. So, um, and now like when the body is in high stress and if you experience disappointment, frustration, judgment or fear, this fear, uh, triggers cortisol release and make you feel threatened even if you're not in a, like a, even if there's no threat to your life, this is the fight or flight um, uh, chemical. So, uh, so you can imagine if you're feeling stressed all the time and frustrated or disappointed all the time, this cortisol hormones is being released and uh, you'll be at this heightened level of um, uh, threat, feeling threatened all the time. So what would this like, if you have constantly high cortisol level, what would this cause? Uh, it would affect all of your system. I'll just highlight a few of the systems. So the heart and the brain, it will definitely affect the heart and the brain by increasing the blood pressure and it would definitely increase glucose levels. And if someone has high blood pressure, it'll, uh, uh, it'll be hard to control these blood pressures with medication. We see many people have, we, who we have to put on many, multiple medications can't control, but once they um, sometimes when they, once they meditate uh, or become aware of their uh, stress levels, the blood pressure control happens naturally. Um, and uh, the problem with this is if you continuously have this, and this becomes a chronic problem, in the blood vessels, the, uh, there's plaque development. It is a combination of high blood pressure, diabetes, and cholesterol. And so stress adds to that, and they can get clogged. You end up with strokes and heart attacks. And also uh, immune system, like uh, it has effects on the immune system. It will make you prone to get more infections, uh, especially viral infections, especially in this COVID era, having your immune system as much, um, um, much as possible is very important. Uh, it can induce cancers too. Um, and it affects the digestive system. Of course, it causes migraines and headaches. And most importantly, it also decreases sensitivity to pain. So cortisol by itself, if it is high, uh, irrespective of what your serotonin is doing, it can decrease your sensitivity to pain. So you'll feel pain more. Um, and then uh, it decreases the serotonin level too. So um, the serotonin, it's the mood stabilizer. So all these effects are going to happen in your body if your cortisol is up. So what is kindness and how can we use kindness to help our body um, 
get to a balance between these good hormones and not so good hormones. Um, kindness is defined as a benevolent action mo motivated by desire to help another without the expectation of a reward. I highlighted the fact without, I'll talk about why it's very important not to expect anything in return when you're doing a kind uh, act of kindness. Um, so research has actually revealed that humans are both generous and kind as a species. We are born inherently to be kind. We just have to practice it and make it a daily routine to make sure that we do it routinely. Um, social scientists have actually built a case for, I, it was very fascinating to read this, that it was the, the Darwin's law or survival of fittest was probably not what he meant. They say now it's probably survival of the kindest and humans are successful as a species be, uh, because of our nurturing, cooperative and compassionate traits. And we look after each other uh, when they are in. And even um, in other species, we have seen that like um, uh, in monkeys and in when vampire bats, they um, feed, they feed um, other like non-related um, um, uh, vampire bats when they are hungry, they don't let them die. So that's this inherent um, feeling of that we need to help each other. So being kind, what does it do? It will increase your uh, dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin and endorphins, which is great because that will give, give you more motivation, reduce uh, your stress and uh, make you more, uh, feel more loving. And then it also reduces your cortisol level. That's the most important thing. People who are kind, this is uh, uh, more research has been done in this area. And people who are kind have 23% less cortisol than um, on an average time than people who are not that kind. Like, so uh, how they decided this was they were going through like their daily routine to see what they were doing and then um, uh, doing blood work to measure their cortisol levels. So they found that, okay, yeah. So this is very important. So this is the reason like, so being kind, when I mentioned like you shouldn't expect anything um, uh, to uh, be uh, like to happen to you in return when you're doing an act of kind kindness because yes say you open it, hold the door open to someone and you're expecting okay they'll let, at least might let you say thank you uh, opening the door act would increase your dopamine the happy chemicals but if you um, expect that return and you don't get it there goes disappointment and that's going to increase your cortisol levels so that act of kindness the kind of nulls out. So being kind is known to scientifically proven to reduce stress, anxiety, and depression. And what's more interesting is it's not only the person who does the act of kindness. It's the person who's receiving the act of kindness will also have these effects. And also some, if someone witnesses this, that person will also have these acts of kindness. So they will also uh, feel calmer, healthier, and happier, which is great. Like it, So that this will um, um, have a... Um, domino effect of increasing. If someone does it, you want the other person might do the same kind of um, uh, same act and um, have more and more people being kind to uh, kind as a society. Um, and there is good literature suggesting that kindness is being um, used in therapy. It is being used right now. The evidence-based way of using it in therapy is treating pain, depression, and anxiety. I think there's much more ways we can use it to help um, all, all our mental and physical uh, health. But this is, I'm just talking about what's evidence-based. And how they're using it is using kindness and together with mindful meditation. So they are incorporating kindness into daily routines. That's the most important thing. And also uh, documenting your gratitude and acts of kindness that was done. This reminds me in Sri Lanka, we, our elders actually had something called a pimpota where they used to write down their good deeds and they take it out. Um, th these are like, I don't think anyone does it now, but they used to take it out. And apparently they were reading these, like when they have leisure moments, which, which actually would keep, 
uh, let your brain know, okay, well, I've done these things and I'm happy about it. I haven't accepted anything in um, return, but just reminding yourself of these kind deeds would actually make you feel happier and your endorphins, your dopamine, your serotonin and um, your oxytocin will uh, flow through and which would be great. So why, why is it all important to in, incorporate uh, kindness into daily routine? Because um, the one act of kindness wouldn't last you for days or weeks. It only, uh, the chemical boost will only last for about three to four minutes. And um, so you need to put kindness on repeat without any expectations. And these are just a few examples, just a tiny bit, um, action of kindness would take you a long way. And you know, like prompting yourself to act with kindness is hard. It's not, it takes a little bit of willpower to keep reminding you that's where the mindfulness comes in. That's where the meditation comes in. So um, I'll just talk a little bit of um, how, how this helps mindfulness and meditation. Um, uh, so the mindfulness actually helps the brain to function more efficiently. And so when the brain is not engaged in higher order thinking processes, it defaults back to a default mode network. It's kind of known as the me center or the monkey center. So you, you just um, think about yourself or your mind just wanders without um, any restrictions and you're not thinking um, like it, it can, as you know, that mind can go thousands of miles away um, uh, without any encouragement. So um, the excess time in default mode network has, is, has been known to cause me health, mental health problems such as uh, anxiety, depression, as attention disorders. And also uh, it causes high levels of amyloid beta deposits to accumulate in the brain. So this is a protein that's very toxic to the brain neurons, and this leads to Alzheimer's um, disease uh, and other cognitive changes. So, um, so we need to reduce our time of default mode network. And this is why mindful training is known to reduce default mode activity and st stimulate other aspects of healthy brain function. So just a little bit of other function that mindful um, meditation does. It does increase the cortical thickness of the free prefrontal cortex, which is uh, you, uh, useful for uh, emotional regulation. And we can all, we all, all of us can use um, a little bit of thickness there for our emotional regulation. I definitely could. Um, and then um, anterior cingulate gyrus, which is uh, important for, um, attention and control, that cortical thickness will also increase. Importantly, the amygdala, uh, this center, this is the center that um, sends messages to increase your cortisol levels. Um, meditation will reduce the amount of uh, brain cells in the amygdala, which will reduce your cortisol response. And then the hippocampus is the memory center, so it will help you uh, with your memory too. And not only that, mindfulness would have effects on your body otherwise. So um, I, on stroke and heart disease, and I'm just going to highlight, this is a statement uh, that was made by the American Heart Association, actually. They actually looked into mindfulness, uh, got, did a systematic review and a meta-analysis all, of all the studies that was done up to that point. And there were differences in like, the methodology of the studies. So they were they couldn't compare head to head, but they came up with few things that they were sure that mindfulness and meditation would help. There were other things, many other things that could have helped, but they didn't have enough evidence. So um, it's, it's known to reduce your odds of having a stroke and heart attack. And it reduces blood pressure. It is increasing smoking cessation rates. And most importantly, um, it reduced progression of atherosclerosis. I'll tell you, um, and, and also it elevates uh, mental fatigue after a stroke, if you've had a stroke. This um, atherosclerosis, progression of atherosclerosis is very important and it's related to my research too, um, because um, th this is the commonest cause of like, people having plaques in their uh, blood vessels is the commonest cause of stroke worldwide. And we have been trying numerous things, uh, medications, um, uh, interventions, nothing had really ha helped and people um, have a very high risk of recurrence rate. And 
and uh, every all the medication just help reduce progression and there's no regression of the plaques but there's some research coming out that meditation might help even regression of the plaques rather than stopping the progression okay so those are some of the um, uh, effects on the body for meditation and mindfulness so I just want to wrap up with saying uh, building a kindful nation will help all of us uh, as a society and kindness is essential to help human survival. There was a survey of 130 uh, people from 130 countries and uh, it showed that irrespective of whether you were poor or rich, people who gave more tended to be happier. And also there was a study done, a 30 year study, which was a great study that women who volunteered for charity were 16% less likely to suffer a major illness during that period. But I wanted to highlight like they, they specifically mentioned during that period, because again, like they, they, they only measured during that period, but um, this is something you need to build into your routines. This is not something you can do for a week or two and expect uh, changes to happen in your body and mind. And kindness is like a boomerang. It'll come back to you at some way, but you should not be expecting it. And in any social order, it helps us cultivate a system of individual and groups who may help us later. And then being kind to one person inspires others to various acts of kindness in our community. And so let's make the world a little bit kinder. Thank you. Wow, that was such an amazing, amazing uh, presentation. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Sashi, uh, for sharing your uh, insights. And I think this is a kind of uh, uh, the presentation uh, people were looking forward to uh, listening, hearing, seeing, because the people are very interested in science and uh, uh give me a second okay and uh, all right so um and i think uh, this is the very reason why i have undertaken uh this uh, global movement uh i knew uh uh you know that <laughs> the science can prove that once we choose to become kindful mindful and uh, it will make our, our, our world a planet a better place to live so um I, I, let me take some questions uh, from the audience can you go to the chat uh, this okay um uh here's a uh, Um, a wonderful explanation. Thank you, Dr. Sashi. Can you give us some examples of default mode network practices we engage with, with in our daily life? So great question. Thank you, Dr. Greco, um, uh, for that question. Uh, I think it's mostly like uh, remunerating uh, us, like thinking over and over again about something that happened, right? Like you, you. Uh, for example, I use my um, um, example of um, the holding the door open for someone, and then um, that person doesn't smile at you or say thank you, and that person has already forgotten about it. But you, your brain goes on and on thinking about, okay, like, why did they not do it? Like, what was wrong? So those kind of thinking, you are not mindful, you are not present at the moment. This doesn't mean that you have to be thinking of something very like significant all the time. It's just mean like, again, comes back to being mindful and being in the moment um, and not allowing your brain to think of unnecessary like things that would not help you, which is again, very hard to do. You, you have to build it into practice. I hope that answers uh, the question. Okay. Um, and there's another question. What is meant by higher order thinking process? So exactly. So higher order thinking process would be uh, the mindfulness, being in the moment, and and th that's the th that's what you need to do. Like even when you're relaxing, like you're not thinking of like what you have to do, like planning your research projects or something like that. Uh, when you're planning your research projects, you focus on that. That is what higher order th thinking is. But when you're um, somewhere like enjoying with your friends or at a lakeside, you're relaxing you take that moment in and you think 
about that moment. So it all comes to mindfulness being in the present moment. Okay, uh, there's another question for you. In research, someone practices meditation, uh, change physical structure is already, you explained. Uh, and my question is how to change mental structure? <laughs> So it, definitely meditation. So as I pointed out in that, um, I can go back on to the slide and show. Uh, so here, like the mental structure, once you meditate, your mental structure will definitely change. And as, um, as Christine mentioned, uh, the Dalai Lama's brain is very different from our brain, or many meditation practitioners' brains are different because they have more um, areas that have come, like that, that, that have become more prominent, that are more empathic. So that would definitely help you your mental thinking too. Like it's not a process that will ha happen overnight or even weeks, months. You have to develop it, and if you expect. One thing I found is if, if you do something expecting, okay, this is going to cause me, like make me more calmer or uh, um, like less angrier, that, that's not how you should do it. And I, I know Bhante, you can explain this better than I can, but you have to just do it because like without expectations. So mm -hmm. then it, you, the uh, gains are much more. Yeah, uh, okay. So uh, this is the question, how does, Habitual action going to be controlled by selected chemicals to maintain self-satisfaction to achieve abnormal situations? Hmm, great questions. So um, um, the habitual actions actually are going to, um, if I understand the um, question correctly, like, so habit, when, when you mean habitual actions, you mean like if you're doing some routine like kindness or something that uh, we habitually build into our um, daily routine, how, it, uh, how is it going to help maintain self-satisfaction? Um, and so once you um, do these routine activities and your brain is adapted to having a balanced level of uh, these chemicals and your structure is a little changed, when you're faced with a um, heightened situation or a situation where your cortisol levels are going to increase, it's actually like um, doesn't increase as much as in people who uh, haven't done these habitual practices. So that's a way that your body responds, like your body is telling you, okay, I think this is a threatened situation, but um, I can look at this um, from perspectively and think, uh, and uh, I, I don't have to get too worried about this. So that's a way of your body. And then cortisol levels doesn't increase as much as you normally would do. So that would help with uh, you facing the abnormal situations. Amazing. I think um, uh, Dr. Sashi Pereira, you enlighten us. <laughs> You know, science is amazing. You know, uh, I think this reminds me of uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama, uh, who once said to an audience of uh, scientists in, in, in the world, uh, he kindly encouraged the uh, scientists to look into or to do research into uh, mindfulness, kindness, compassion, love, light, and et cetera, et cetera. So, Almost all uh, scientists were doubtful. This a religion cannot help us. <laughs> so uh, one neuroscientist, Richard Davidson, thought if a, if a person like uh, Dalai Lama encourages us to do some uh, some research like this, uh, there should be some truth in it. And I think that's what led him to do the research into brain and meditation, mindfulness, and he invited uh, uh, Matthew Ricard to his lab in the University of Wisconsin. <laughs> and then when they monitored his brain, um, they found it amazing. Wow, this is, that's why the Time Magazine branded him or named him as the happiest man on earth. And I think meditation, kindness, practice, compassion, these are amazing universal values and anyone can uh, cultivate them. And also 
Dr. Sashi, what you uh, said, you know, uh, how in Sri Lanka the the uh, elderly people read, you know, the something positive they have done, and and uh, I, I highly talk about that. It's called the Book of Merit, <laughs> and. Uh, when you go through something difficult or when, some, when you become unhappy, if you go, uh, go through the, all the good things you have done, uh, you feel good about it. So uh, I'm very grateful to you, Dr. Sashi, for making a wonderful presentation.